Hello and welcome to the English Reviews and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I am the Silver Quill Ranger. Asha, ho, hatisha. Alrighty then. So anywho, in this discussion, we are going to talk about, well, the Sixth Ranger Syndrome and Reforming Villains. Or, in short, the heel to face turn trope. Yes, it's a trope, folks. So if you guys got no idea what this trope is, in summary, it's when a bad guy turns good. This usually makes for a good plot for three reasons. It lets the team reintroduce the villain as a darker, edgier hero. Two, it reinforces the desired notion of inherent goodness within people. And three, it prevents the worthy opponent from falling victim to what senseless waste of human life. That's a trope too. And before I forget, this episode is Patreon sponsored by Master of Lag. Thank you so much, my friend, for suggesting this topic for us. So, anywho, uh, since this is the discussion, we're just going to try what we did last time when we did our Season 7 retrospective. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And that is to talk and just throw things to the wall and see if it sticks. So, um, I'm going to... Oh my. (laughs) So, I'm just going to try and see, you know, since we're a pony podcast, let's go for ponies. In My Little Pony, it happens with our main gal, Sunset Shimmer. She was a villain and somehow through the power of Magical Rainbow Blast, it turned her good. Nah, it, it didn't really turn her good, but uh, she was reintroduced to the light side. Would you agree, Silver? It did something. I mean, I'm always a little curious about when they say, oh, the elements turned her good. I mean, good and evil are not so easily defined as A or B binary. Mm-hmm. But they gave her a shock and she hit rock bottom. I've always been curious about the tears uh, Sunset displayed when she was transforming into that evil demon. Mm-hmm. What was that showing her, or did it just hurt a lot? I didn't really care about her reformation when it happened. It wasn't until after Rainbow Rocks when uh, she actually was more proactive, when she was, you know, the underdog in the story. Then I started to care. It's like, now, Sunset, now you are interesting. Well done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it hurts a lot. Like, having no wings, suddenly having wings, and they're not... Uh, angelic, they're demonic, so it had kind of claws or spikes on it, and yeah, that's got hurt. Indeed. So, what do you think of her turn from a villain to a good guy, or heel to face? Well, it all comes down to how much time do you invest in the trans in the transition. A lot of it was her has been her finding her footing. Rainbow Rock, she was so uncertain of herself, so uneager to speak out. Friendship games, she was willing to be more forward and easygoing, but she hadn't really stepped up as team leader. That didn't happen until she saw someone making the same mistake and wanted to to save that version of Twilight. And then by Camp Everfree, she, or Legend of Everfree, there she really steps in as the group leader and guide because she's the one who's has the most experience with magic, both good and bad. True. So she knows the pitfalls, but she also knows the the benefits, the wonder. And it just keeps going from there. So I like the the progression, the the step. Meanwhile, her the other characters haven't really gotten to grow as much other than accepting the magic, which is always the danger with six ranger syndrome. You're sp- you're investing a lot of energy to make this character look good. Have you done anything to help the other characters? Uh, true that. True that. And you're mentioning about Human Twilight. Like, could she be considered a quote-unquote sixth stranger to the team? It's a little weird because she's sort of filling the role that Equestrious Twilight filled. But, yeah, I I think you could. She certainly had more focus and more of a chance to define herself. But she hasn't been quite as standout as Sunset. Mostly because... She is held by, uh, held back by the fact she's Twilight, That's... and we've seen a Twilight. Yeah, true that, true that, and and also talking about this, like I, I, I'm just thinking of this scenario in my head where most of Equestria Girl's story or well, story or plot, whatever it is, revolves around 
a bad guy turning good, except for the sirens, because we got no idea what happened to them. For example, we have Sunset, who, well, was a villain turned good. Twilight was a villain turned good. Y- yes, okay. And then we have um, Gloriosa, villain turned good. And then we have Juniper, villain turned good. And as Pinky said, we are a really forgiving group. Indeed. And even in the latest special, yeah, uh, Wallflower, would you consider her a villain? Or just a... Um, Antag- antagonist, to be sure. Mm-hmm. But still, uh, you have the interaction there. So, My Little Pony Quest Struggle has a lot of that going for it. Indeed. Which sometimes works for and against it. Part of what makes the Sirens so fun is that they were not a redeemable group. They had to be defeated, but you couldn't just say, oh, we're all friends now. Oh. I still wonder if they're, they'll ever try to get payback. Oh, you, I, I beg to differ, Silver, because a lot of fanfic kind of wants, uh, are kind of redeeming them. Um, if not for, what you call this, friendship thing, it's just like, oh, I begrudgingly respect your uh, uh, existence. <laughs> uh, but still, that's fanfic. It's not canon. <laughs> that's right. I... I... Don't try to base the whole fandom opinion off uh, fanfics. No no disrespect meant towards said authors, but I like that the Sirens have not been redeemed. I would also like to see them come back to get revenge. Oh, true that too, true that too. I'm just in the uh, scenario of if a story is done right, then I'll enjoy it. If it's done poorly, then nah, you ain't getting my vote. So let's head to the Pony Universe for a bit because... In that world, too, we got a lot of uh, heel to face. And a good example is Shimsham, because she was a villain, um, and a notable villain at that, too. She traveled through time just to mess with Twilight. For a time, I thought she was a better villain than a hero. Yeah, she, she did a good job. Like, she had focus, and her focus is to mess Twilight up. And, it, you know, when you really think about it, that is a very bad plan. What's your end game? Basically, just to mess Twilight up and be like, "Oh, right, she saved the world." Whoops! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoop. But whoopsie, uh, whoopsie. <laughs> but still, um, her heel turn or her face turn was pretty good because in the end, whatever she did, it was pointless. It was um, rendered null and void because Twilight kept on going. Like the phrase. I could do this all day, bro. You got nothing, bro, Ziff. Yep, yep. So, her turn was pretty sudden, if you ask me. Like, I seen the episode, it was not bad. Like, the thing where, in the end, um, whatever Starlight Glimmer was doing uh, was rendered pointless and mute until she kind of accept the fact that, okay, um... I accept friendship from you, Twilight. And let's see where this goes. It wasn't really that quick of a, what you would call this, turnaround. Like, she had to still learn from Twilight how to be a good person. That's really appreciated. And she relapsed more than a few times. Uh, <laughs> every little thing she does. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, that one was a good one where... Um, I don't know how to do this, and I don't really know how to interact with people. You know what? I'm just going to use magic. Yeah, magic, magic, magic. Seems to work, right? <laughs> it's magic. Oh, I brainwashed my friends. Oh, I could solve all my problems instantly. Oh, and then they had a terrible hangover the next day. Oh, no. <laughs> Not so loud. <laughs> so... Another character I want to talk about is Trixie. Trixie, would you count Trixie as a villain turned good? Hmm. She certainly did villainous things, especially with the Yon Alicorn Amulet. Her redemption has been more subtle, I think. She's still the bad girl of the group. <laughs> yeah. She still enjoys being the tr- the troublemaker. But she she does she is there when it counts, and she is empathetic with others. She hasn't had a lot of chance to interact. That's the that's the big thing holding her back. Yeah, she's gets along with Twilight despite some competitiveness, mm-hmm. but she hardly says anything to the other main six. So she's Starlight's friend, but she's moving in completely different circles. I can see that. I can see that. 
And yeah, it's one of those interaction thing because um, Trixie here mostly interacts with Starlight and probably Maud. Like they're their own. They they have their own group of friends, which is good because if you need to revolve the main six all the time, and eh, it ain't gonna be fun. And talking about yeah. interactions, um, we got Discord. He was the big bad of season two, and somehow got teamed by Fluttershy. Would he count as the sixth ranger syndrome? He hasn't been, he's not as steady a presence, but he is there more and more. True that, true that. And he is one of those characters where he's not really good because still he is the Lord of Chaos. Was it? Was that his title? Because I'm trying not to mix with fan fiction in my head. Oh, he is the Lord of Chaos. Ah, right. Yeah. Spir- or sometimes the spirit of chaos and disharmony. Ah, right. So he's still dead. Like, oh, there's another character I wanted to mention, but I'm going to finish with this card first. And so he's still dead. He is chaos incarnate. But he still has friends with uh, Fluttershy. He has tea parties with Fluttershy. And he has, in this world, G&G. Or is it O&O? Ogres and Oubliettes? Ogres and Oubliettes, yep. Yeah, so... Uh, he has sessions with um, Big Mac and Spike. So he's kind of neutral, I think. Not really good, but not really bad. <laughs> Chaotic neutral? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You could say that. But I'm not sure. Like, How do you describe Discord, Silver? I mean, um, previous Discord, you can say that he's villainous, but what? how do you describe the new Discord? A child. Basically, he had nothing... To slow to slow him down or or give him a perspective check until Fluttershy. So for a long time he was just a kid playing with toys. He didn't. Uh, he was very egocentric. Now with Fluttershy and her guidance, he's becoming better, and it opens him up to a world where he can be hurt, where he can be disappointed, where he realizes it's not all about him, and that is a big part of this. Uh, it's why he struggles so much. He wants to be the center of attention, but then realizes that he's not always going to be such. So there's the there's the conflicting ego versus a growing spirit of other centeredness. And he still sometimes helps out in the most chaotic or uh, antagonizing ways. I'm thinking of uh, what about discord? (laughs) But he he is trying to be better. And that that, too, is a good redemption. Now, sometimes like with. Gilda or Diamond Tiara, you get a moment where they have a wake up, but there's no follow up. With all the characters we've mentioned, they've had episodes devoted to well, saying, "Here we are. This is what what where they're at right now." And I think they benefit from it. I think because we walk with them on a journey through their redemption, we, the audience, become more empathetic to the fact that they're trying. Mm-hmm. True, true. And you mentioned two other characters that, yeah. They are, uh, they were villains. Now they're quote unquote redeemed. Um, not to the six ranger level where they join the team or join the main crew, but to a point where they're fan favorites. Well, one of them is. Um, I like Gilda a lot, so I'm biased. So uh, we don't really see Gilda a lot in the show. I mean, okay, she was redeemed in that one map episode um, what was it called I forgot but still uh, the the lost treasure of Griffinstone yes thank you so much. Um, she was redeeming that episode where she well begrudgingly helped Rainbow Dash and they all had a group hug but there's no follow up like you mentioned there's no follow up on what's progressing we did get that one shot with uh, Gabby where she Help sent a letter from Gilda to Rainbow. So, yeah, that's something. And then another scenario here is, like you mentioned, Diamond Tiara. She uses her talent of manipulating her parents to get what she wants, and that is to help the school get the new playground up, was it? Yep, she uses her parents to fund the new uh, playground. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's and, something. And then she disappears. Yeah. Like, okay, we did get that one close, um, that one what, shot of the Derby Racers where uh, Diamond Tiara is participating in a race with her butler and 
her acting um, concern of the butler when the butler is hurt in the crash? Or is it just my imagination? Yep, you are remembering correctly. We also saw in Bloom and Gloom... No, no. No, that was earlier. The episode after Crusaders of the Lost Mark. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. That's season six. On your marks. We saw her baking with Silver Spoon and one other filly. But we've never seen her... Well, she's never had a speaking role. She's never been as proactive in uh, in doing anything. In essence, she's become a background fixture. Oh, no. Oh, and... Th- Okay, by the by the time this podcast airs, let's see, Marks what's it what's it called? Marks for Effort will have aired. And I've seen the I've seen the uh oh Finland. Oh, oh that one. The Finland release. Yeah. It, while they're cleaning up Chirali's school, Diamond Tiara is nowhere to be seen. I thought, oh, that's a that's a missed opportunity right there. Oh. Are we still saying she's above cleaning? Or maybe it's not her day to clean. See, this is one of those scenarios where, okay, I couldn't really say much because I haven't watched it yet. It's one of those things where I'm not going to spoil myself for this one because I don't want to read subtitles. You know, it's simple as that. And I haven't gotten to read the subtitles because I can't make them work. That's <laughs> why I'm looking forward to the English version. Yeah. But I, I will say Silver Spoon is seen cleaning things up. Yeah. It's like, eh! Her best friend is cleaning. Why is Diamond Tiara not there? Maybe she's doing something Ooh, else. Oh, in a high pitch voice. <laughs> Maybe she's doing something else. But okay. Um. Um. Another. Well, we're sticking for ponies for a bit because that's what we do. Um. I, I think we should jump for ponies for a bit after this. But still. Um. The other one is the changelings. The entire changelings. Oh, the changelings. Yeah, Empire. Like, they were evil, but now they're good. <laughs> that one felt a little forced because like oh we can actually share feelings I didn't know we could do that it's like of course you could do that are you telling me in all these years you've never had friends even amongst changelings no we never were but, friends we're just rivals Ugh. now personally I, I like it was after to change a changeling where pharynx may have been an even better example mm-hmm. of a six ranger he stood out more than any other changeling. He was a better fighter mm-hmm, mm-hmm. than any other changeling. And he got the super cool design, which may actually look better than Thorax. Oh, yeah, because he's darker, and darker is good. He's definitely the anti-hero-esque. <laughs> he's the Luna of the group. Luna! <laughs> Luna, 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 Pharynx, Pharynx, Pharynx. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, what you mentioned there is true. Um, I think, yeah, Pharynx can be put in that Six Ranger slot. Instead of working with the main six, he's working with the Changeling Empire because beforehand, they were no defense for the Changelings. Everybody's so passive that it irked Pharynx so bad that he took up the mantle of hero, or in this case, anti-hero. Now that everybody accepts him for who he is, he's kind of accepted in the group and changed and morph. And it will be interesting to see where this goes. If it goes, he had a brief walk on in school days, but we've not gotten to hear a word out of him since. No. Not a peep, I say. True that, true that. Not a peep. And as peep. a quick bonus, Luna or uh, Nightmare Moon. That one feels a little different. In some cases, Nightmare Moon is almost a completely separate character from Luna, even though she is born from Luna's more negative aspects. It's almost like Luna has been waking up from a nightmare herself. I don't know if I'd count that in the same redemptive category as Starlight or Trixie or Discord. True, but it's worth a mention because somebody out there will just scream at us if we don't mention it. Not to mention, I still raise a lot of issues when the people say, oh, the elements cha- made her good again. What does that mean? Is good a tangible resource? Can you fill up your good meter and f- and wash out the bad? It sounds like you're taking your car in for an oil change. <laughs> uh, that, that sounds bad uh, for a character trope thing. But now, nah. uh, okay, so let's hit on to other shows. So, Silver, um, do you want to talk about shows that you have any idea or do you want me to take over for a bit? Oh, I have a, I have a perfect show for this okay, topic. Okay, go ahead, man. Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Super Dang, with Vegeta. That is what I was going to go for. God dang it. 
Uh, I am one step ahead at this yep. time. <laughs> Sorry, Norman. no problem, no problem. I I, I think like the saying uh, saying goes, uh, "Great mind thinker alike." Indeed. Mm, so for victory for Vegeta. Yes. Yeah, so you want to go for Vegeta okay. first because when we were talking about Discord, I wanted to talk about Beerus, but um, let's go for Vegeta first because I think he's the uh, anti-hero. He's the what you call this bad boy of the group. Uh. For a time, anyway, but then he he mellowed out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, when he first he was the the antagonist of the Saiyan arc, where he pushed Goku to his limits and nearly killed him, and basically just got away sh- simply by being super enduring. But then to make him look super awesome during the Namek saga, he is taking out Frieza's uh, servants left and right, while Krillin and Gohan are basically playing runaway from everything. Uh, Vegeta's the one stepping in and just saying, "Oh hi." Bang. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, bye. Until it's time for Frieza, and then, then it's Goku back in the spotlight. Yeah, but still, Vegeta has this arc to him where he was the main villain of the series in the Saiyan arc, where he is unstoppable. His power level was, well, under 9,000. <laughs> and he was considered to be very, very bad. And like you mentioned before, he mellowed out. When did you notice that he turned good? Like, when? I think it started with Future Trunks, where Vegeta trained with him in the hyperbolic time chamber and began to recognize his son's effort chasing after him. I don't mean that. I mean in the Namek saga, because uh, it was always clear that Vegeta was Vegeta had a goal, and said goal was to defeat Goku, and at the same time to trash Frieza at the same time. Oh, but that's, uh, he didn't turn good in Namek. That's the thing. It was always just the enemy of my enemy or, er, my Saiyan pride, er. Yeah, when, when did that turn? Because I'm trying to look at, I'm trying to think in my head during that time because, okay, uh, if I do remember right, uh, Vegeta was there. He begrudgingly called Krillin and Gohan to the ship to give them armor. And that scenario was pretty cool too. And he gave them spandex and a, really interesting battle armor okay that's cool and then um they fought for a bit and then when namek explode uh, vegeta followed them back to earth and hook up with bruma poor yamcha yeah well that's another six ranger syndrome he he basically forced yamcha out of her relationship <laughs> oh yeah then again it's it's yamcha he he is dragon ball's whipping boy i thought it was krillin well, Krillin actually uh, manages to get stuff done. Poor Yamcha is there just to lose. <laughs> true that, true that. Krillin will get owned, but he'll still get stuff done. <laughs> oh, true that, true that. But, um, so with Vegeta, you mentioned uh, his turn was during his training with his son, uh, Future Trunks, in the hyperbolic time chamber. So, that's interesting. And here's the thing. Vegeta, as far as I know, never apologizes for what he used to do. But Goku and the others forgive him anyway. True that. And, or at least except in Goku, accepts just about anybody right away. But it isn't until Dragon Ball Super that you start to see how much he's changed. Because now it's not just, oh, my family. Now he actually gives a care about other people, including the Saiyans from another dimension. I love Vegeta in that moment where he's fighting a Topo as a god of destruction. Mm-hmm. Topo is, insists, well, if justice cannot keep keep us safe, then I have no need for it. And Vegeta, Vegeta's just like, nuts to you, I never throw anything away. If it's important to me, I don't cast it aside. He shows just how frail Topo's beliefs and power really are. Yeah, true. Um, I, I think most mostly in media, if you believe in something really, really hard, it will somehow be your source of, source of strength. I think that's true in real life as well. Cool that. I mean, it's it sounds very flowery or imaginative. It's not like, oh, this fills you with determination. <laughs> but if there's something you really believe in and want to strive towards, you'll be able to move forward more than something superficial, which can be easily yeah, abandoned. True that, true that. And talking about Dragon Ball, right, we, we also got Piccolo, who was the main villain for the Dragon Ball saga, and... Um, earlier part of no, he was just only in Dragon Ball as the main villain there. In Z, he sorry, <laughs> in Z he 
kind of mellowed out. Yep. Gohan had a very unique effect on him, although I'm still hoping Piccolo would say, look, never sing that song about I Love Piccolo again. <laughs> oh, I, I do hope that Gohan learns to dodge. Why didn't you dodge? <laughs> yes. Uh, a bridge series is really affecting us. <laughs> uh, soon we'll be saying goodbye to the bridge series. Oh, yeah, really? So sad. Well, yeah, they, they're they becoming a... Pro- okay, I'm going on a tangent, mm-hmm. but from what I understand, Team Four Star is becoming a professional voice acting oh. group. And so, but that means they can't engage in projects like the bridge series. Oh, that's so they're going to wrap up the cell saga, and then that's oh, man, it. That, that's depressing to know. It's a little sad. Oh well, well we're talking about Dragon Ball, and I'm going to summarize here because if we just keep babbering on about Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball, there's uh, how how do I put this? Dragon Ball has an abundance of uh, heel to face, and it is a lot in this show. Uh, like, f- let's just count because we got Piccolo, we got Vegeta, then we got the Android seventeen and six. I'm sorry, sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. Then we got who else? Um, I don't have a picture in front of me. Ah, ten. Majin. Yeah, Majin. Um, well, yeah, Majin Buu is one of them. Um, Kid Buu is the jerk. In Super, we got Beerus, and Beerus was considered to be the main bad guy, but not really. He was just doing his job. But still. Uh, you got Beerus and Wish. Then you got the Universe 6 um, characters. We got what? Uh, Champa, Kale, and Cauliflower. Then you got um, who's that time guy? Hit, and so on. And yeah, we got a lot. It's funny. In My Little Pony, it's rainbow ma- beams of magic and mm-hmm. friendship. In Dragon Ball, it's punching your the guy in the face, and then they like <laughs> yeah, 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 and also screaming, and also declaring your special move. Yeah, that's uh, surprise. Here's my surprise attack. It'd be more surprise if you didn't say anything. <laughs> that's surprising. <laughs> oh, how surprising! Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, Dragon Ball is one of those shows where I think they done the formula right, where bad guy turns to good guy, and they join the team. So yay! But they're not all, oh, we're all best friends now. There's there's still lingering resentments or tension. I mean, Vegeta, with the others, it took forever for him to mellow oh, out. Yeah, still, uh, with Vegeta and the rest of the crew, um, <laughs> I think Tian, um, who's uh, Chaozu, Yamcha, and the rest, uh, they're not cool with Vegeta. Like, they respect him, but still, you jerk. You still haven't apologized after all these years. And he pr- probably yep, never will. Yep, yep. Oh, my pride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your stupid Sam pride. So, anywho, um, let's see. What can I do? Um, yeah, uh, since we're talking about Six Ranger, why not go for Power Rangers? Because Power Rangers is the backbone for this conversation. I describe Starlight as Six Ranger Syndrome, mostly based on Tommy the Green yep. Ranger. And for people at home who got no idea what this, uh, what this is or what we're talking about... Way back in the days of, well, 1994 or later, there was a show called Mighty Morphing Power Ranger, and it stars a bunch of, how did Zordon put it, Silver? Overbearing, over-emotional humans with yeah. attitudes. So, high school kids. <laughs> Why on earth would you recruit such a force? <laughs> Alpha, transport to me the best warriors from the planet. I'm talking SEAL Team, French Foreign Legion, uh, MI6. Uh, what you gave me is teenagers. Oh, God. But still, uh, that was pretty interesting. So, this show stars a bunch of teenagers in high school doing daily stuff. Okay, this is just so fiction because no kid would be hanging around the community center being all happy-like. No. So, this kid... Uh, this bunch of kids hang out, or hang around. When trouble arise, they get called to become the Power Rangers, and these Power Rangers go and defeat the monster. And when the monster is defeated, the big boss of the monsters called Rita Repulsa throws her magic wand and makes her monster grow. And with that, the Rangers call upon their big giant robot to beat down the big giant monsters and rinse and repeat the thing that made 
the Green Ranger episode or the Sixth Ranger in this scenario special is because there was a five-part special involving a new ranger. I think this scenario here was unheard of because having your bad guys lose to the bad guy was never heard of before. Am I right, Silver? Well, yeah, the Rangers always won within the span of a of an episode. So suddenly they had this guy wail on them and basically, oh, take down their giant robot by himself. Mm-hmm. You're just like, what the heck? This this seems really awesome. And he didn't just take them out on the battlefield. He also trashed their uh, command center. He's left them at their weakest. And it just goes downhill from there for a while. Here's the thing. Tommy, the Green Ranger, was brainwashed. This wasn't by his own choice. And as a result, he's more he's more victim than villain, even though he does a great maniacal laugh. And that's often the way in Power Rangers. It's very rare that a ranger sides with the villain out of free will. Uh, the only one that's coming to mind is SPD, where the Alpha Squad actually turned traitor, though we never learned why. Hmm. I rarely watch SPD, but still, um, for Power Rangers during its time, it was kind of innovative and amazing and just wow for its time because um, this is a bit off topic, um, not my experience personally, but um, Pat from Two Best Friends Play mentioned this a lot in his well podcast and also uh, playthroughs where he mentioned that when he was young and he was watching Power Rangers and the Rangers lost to the Green Ranger and he asked his mom, uh, is the Power Rangers going to be okay? Are they going to win? And his mom mentioned that, oh boy, um, sometimes the good guy don't win. <laughs> and hearing that as a kid would crush you. Well, it would. That's a hard reality. We're, we're raised on stories where the good guy wins. But, honestly, I just take it now. The story's ne- just because characters depart doesn't mean the story's over. True that. True that. But with that in mind, I'd like to, to turn this on its ear a little. Mm-hmm. Because there's a there's a there's a sixth ranger who's a green ranger, but is even more of a sixth ranger than Tommy. Oh, oh. it is Burai from the Japanese version that became Power Rangers, uh, Ju Ranger. Okay, but wait, it, so, sorry, go ahead. You said wait. Yeah, because I, I wanted to say something, but uh, let's just hear what you have to say because the original footage that the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was based on, uh, Ju Ranger. Um, yeah, that is spoiler, but let's let's see what you have to say. Well, okay, uh, Burai, who was the Dragon Ranger, he was the Red Ranger's uh, brother, separated at birth uh, because he was raised by a noble family. Both of them were, but one family could not bear children, so uh, as sort of a peacekeeping arrangement, Burai was given over. And during a tragedy, uh, his family was killed, and he blamed the Red Ranger's family for it. So Burai, uh, in this in that series, he's not brainwashed. He's in control of his actions. He knows what he's doing, and he just doesn't care because he's so angry. And so the arc is him basically pursuing a personal vendetta, even joining with and eventually turning on Bandora, who would become Rita Repulsa. And... It isn't until a final battle where he gets to have it out with the Red Ranger. And the Ranger, Red Ranger throws down his weapon and says, you're my brother, I'm not going to fight you. And he, just as he's about to, to strike the final blow, he finds he just can't do it. And so he lets go of his anger, joins the team. And over time, by helping them, he becomes an accepted member of the team. So much so that when his, his own life is about to end, there's the green candle arc. Uh, the whole team is just chipping in, trying to find ways to save, to uh, find a solution. And one of the best parts of this story is that th- Burai, one of his first acts in the show, was to slap a child. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a best act, but work, roll with me, please. Silver, I, I think uh, there's a show in Australia called The Slap. <laughs> I'm thinking more of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, shut up, short round. Uh but then as another kid is is dying, the uh, Barai gives the, a solution that could save his life to the child because he realizes that's more important. It's 
this is a guy who was so driven by anger he'd strike at children. Now he's let go of that anger and worked with others. He cares more about the kids that need protection. And so he becomes the true hero. That is a great Six Ranger arc in my eyes. And yes, he does die. Yeah, that's the spoiler I was going to say because um, in Zhu Ranger, the Six Ranger, the Green Ranger, or the Dragon Ranger dies. It's like, wow, okay, woof. But this is where I think it surpasses Power Rangers. There's still fallout to uh, or consequence to that death. His spirit will guide the team during the climb during the show finale, and his uh, partner, Dragon Zord in America, Dragon Caesar in uh, Japan, which is actually sentient. It spends a whole episode mourning his loss and being really depressed. And you're like, oh my gosh, the Power Rangers seems kind of pale by comparison. My- I usually prefer the Japanese Sentai to the American adaptation. True, that is true. But still, it's one of those scenarios where it was done for set location and, well, it was, how was it, um, localized, yes. Localized. But uh, back on the theme of the Sixth Ranger, he's introduced, he outperforms the entire team and is a major threat. Even the show's villains can't keep him in, in line. And yet, through a very climactic battle and of active choice to change he begins to become more accepted he be- he begins to change who he is he becomes a better person it's sort of a testament to his journey that his final act is to save a young life whereas before it was all about taking a life and it's very much like starlight assisting the changelings although i'd argue her crowning moment of getting over her past was when she advocated for stygian and when she spoke out on his behalf because he could not that was, in my eyes, the best uh, Starlight moment. Yeah, I have to. I have to agree because Starlight here, like, she, <laughs> how do I put it? She understands the map more than Twilight did. So, what does this say, Twilight? Well, Twilight was not in a, not in a good headspace. Mm-hmm. She was so starstruck, mm. star swirl struck. <laughs> 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 uh, I made a funny. You did, uh, and well, let's see. With the Green Ranger or the Six Ranger, well, with Power Rangers, like. There have been so many rangers coming in and out from the show that it's kind of, well, it's a regular thing. I'm trying to remember a specific ranger episode where the character was a bad guy and then came in good, but nothing comes to mind now. Like I've got one. Oh, okay. Maybe even better than Tommy the Green Ranger was... Uh, I think his name is Eric, the Titanium Ranger. Oh, that's the exclusive American one. Yep. America finally claimed its own exclusive Ranger. I remember. It. And the Titanium Ranger, he was not brainwashed. He was deceived and angry, but he 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 wasn't under a spell or anything. And so a big part of his arc is accepting what who he was, who he wants to be, and reconciling with his family. Wow, that is that is awesome, and yeah, um, for for original Ranger series or character, that was pretty good. I'm remembering uh, and one. It's not that great, but it's from Power Rangers uh, RPM. Um, RPM, for those who don't know, is set in a post-apocalyptic world where the world is conquered by the machines. Ah, T one thousands, the scream. But, uh, spoilers ahead, there's one character who is the bad guy. She is kind of a cyborg. And she was commanding the, you know, um, robot unit or whatever it is to destroy the humans. And unbeknownst to the rangers, um, how, how do I summarize this? You know what? I'm just going to summarize this as best as my memory can give me. And... Long story short, near the end, uh, she, the bad guys betray her and she joins the group and ends up she is the long lost sister to one of the rangers. So they reunite. So yeah, it's not a really good explanation, but try watching RPM. It's pretty good. It is, although I'll always remember uh, the villainess for her when she's fighting the blue ranger. Black's the loner, red's the leader... Yellow's the girl. Green's the comic relief. What are you? Blue replies, I'm Scottish. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. 
That was awesome so writing. Just, that was awesome. <laughs> that's just fun. Oh, wow. But uh, going outside Power Rangers, because, mm-hmm. you know, Six Ranger Syndrome is pretty fun to talk about when it's the Rangers themselves. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Norman, I think you had an example from a certain TV show aimed at teenagers and based on a movie. Oh, um, mind refreshing me because my memory's kind of dull right now. We were going to talk about Spike, but not Dragon Spike. Spike, but not Dragon Spike. Spike. Oh, uh, oh mm, mm. <laughs> wow, uh, memory's derping. <laughs> Which one is it, Silva? Oh, well, then allow me to try and fill in. Uh, Buffy the Vampire oh, Slayer. Oh, that one. Okay. Uh, yes. A TV... A TV show based on a movie that honestly surprised me with how good it was. Yes, um, the TV, sorry, the movie was pretty awesome and innovative for its time. And the TV show was, it had a cult following, let's just say that. I, th- I thought it rather exceptional. They went far darker than I thought they would. Oh yeah, true that. So one of the few things about Buffy the Vampire Slayer is it was awesome, it was innovative for its time, the writing was great and it was done by Josh Whedon who started Avengers so you can just imagine how awesome it is so one of the few things that the show does is it started out as monster of the week kind of show and it progressed to become more of a adventure story where the lead character Buffy uh, played by Sarah Michelle Gillar if I'm not mistaken yes indeedy during the first season, she was in high school, but hey, uh, this is one of those shows where you couldn't be in high school forever. You need to get a real job. So she kind of became a vampire hunter. Full, full time. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so I don't know how you get paid for that. Oh. Government funding. <laughs> I believe it was the second season where Spike made his entrance. Mm-hmm. And Spike is one of those, I'm a bad boy vampire. Ooh, look at me. You all are going to love me. And we did. We did indeed. And he he was a mainstay of the show for a very long time. I was genuinely surprised. Because he had appeal. Like, all of the ladies who sued over him. But he also had a link to Angel. Yes, Angel. Um, Angel was the love interest for Buffy for a while. And then he got his own spin-off. Why what was the reason that Angel moved out from Buffy? Well, I don't know if you mean actor or... The character. Like, why did he had to move? Like, why? I mean, I, I don't remember. If memory serves, Buffy needed a little time. And so Angel, he said to her, well, don't worry, I'm not getting any older. <laughs> so they'd been through a lot together, and it was all a little shaky. And so Buffy just needed time and space to collect herself. Mm-hmm. So Angel went struck off on his own. Spike, meanwhile, though he started as a villain, over time, just sort of this antagonistic relationship with Buffy, I think more often than not, it was the you know enemy of my enemy is my friend, or needs have forced us to work together. True, true. And after a time, it had an impact on Spike. He actually started to uh, to not mellow out, but change his priorities. I remember uh, one time at thanks uh, Thanksgiving episode, he was basically being held by the um, by the Buffy and friends. <laughs> and he's like, "Can I can I have some blood? I I could really use some blood." And Buffy's like, uh, "I'm making gravy. That has blood in it, right? <laughs> you know what else has blood in it? Blood." <laughs> but over time, just through interactions like that, just. By interacting with with the characters as a full fledged character himself, he underwent a change. And by the time Angel's spinoff came, he actively worked alongside Angel to save lives. Oh, uh, what what was it, an episode where he talks to a a very an all knowing being, but you can't ask it any questions. And life is at stake, so so Spike just gets fed up with this guy. Is like, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <laughs> Also, why is grass green? And why should I keep doing this? Come on, a life's at stake. I don't have time for your quirks. <laughs> I mean, that's how much he cared. He was willing to risk uh, the wrath of a very powerful uh, mythical being to save a human life. All because 
he'd gotten he'd become fond of humans <laughs> thanks to these these characters with whom he interacted. And it's the same for uh Discord as it was for Barai, as it was for Spike. Mm-hmm. It's all about interaction and I think slowly building up a character to be redeemed or to change their values. It affects a change that we feel like we've gotten to experience with the character. Yeah, and I, I totally agree because the well, my memory is a bit short with uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and whatever is involved with it. But hearing you talk about Spike and what he did, it's one of those scenarios where oh, this character is awesome. Like, he was a jackass and now he is a good guy. Huh. I wonder how his transformation is going to become when I see from, what you call this, where, if I were to watch the whole series. I need to brush up as well, but it, Buffy did things very unexpected, and I, I enjoyed that. For his time, it was kind of innovative. Very, and that's why it's a cult classic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anything else, Silver, you want to add? Because we have been running really, really long, so maybe we could do some kind of rapid fire? Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, rapid fire sounds good. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. There was Diarca of Gundam Seed, mm-hmm. who st- started on one side of the war, but eventually became a member of the very ship he, he pursued. Okay. The, things did not go well for him in Sea Destiny, so yeah. <laughs> we don't talk about that. Yeah, we don't talk about Destiny. No, no, no. Um, I have one for you, Silver. Um, the Terminator. Oh, yes. Da, 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 da. Yep. Uh, in da, da, the da, da, first da. Terminator, he was the assassin to kill Sarah Connor. And then, well, he perished. And yeah, it was kind of an okay movie. It had his following, but what made it go beyond was Terminator 2 when the T-1000 came back to save John Connor. And yeah, it was kind of a heel-to-face turn, a really big one at that too, because nobody was expecting it. And the setup for this was amazing. Just imagine this. You were in, what, this movie came out in 94, right? Something like that? Yep. So just imagine this. The world has no internet. So you watching the first Terminator movie knows that the T-1000 is an evil, evil creature or character. I think you remember how the Terminator 2 start, right? With the T-1000 coming in, stealing clothes, and then you have this police or officer who is trying to find um, John... um, uh, who's Connor? Uh, John Connor. So, just imagine this: you have two characters tr- um, trying to look for John Connor. So, in your head, you'll be expecting the police officers to be the protector, right? Mm-hmm. But you're wrong. The Terminator is the protector, not the police officer. The gasp! Oh my god! And that was a turn. That was really amazing. To everything, turn, turn, turn. Mm-hmm. That, that, that was amazing during the time. So he joined the crew, and I wouldn't say he's the sixth ranger. Kind of, yes, no, I, I don't know. It was interesting. Third, third ranger in this case, but... Mm-hmm. Or what it counts fourth if you count the John's father who passed away. Ah, <laughs> so confusing. Yeah. So who's next on your list, Silver? Oh, gosh, uh, putting me on the spot. I, I cleared through a, a good number of them. Oh, I, I, okay, um... I have one, and that's Mag- Magnus, uh, Magus, Magus, uh, M E G U S, Magus from Chrono Trigger. Ah, I haven't played Chrono Trigger. Uh you should. It's a really good game. But anywho, um, he was the main antagonist, or one of the antagonists f- for our heroes. He was really powerful. He was really, really bad. And then some event happened where he joined the good guy crew, and he was well with. with Every or with any show or any game that involves your bad guy joining the good guy crew, they have to be underpowered, which is kind of sucky. But you have that there. Um, your bad guy turned good and joins the crew, and he's quote unquote the sixth ranger of the crew. So he is awesome. Like, go watch Let's Play of this and you'll understand why. I get you. Mm-hmm. And I have one to add as well now. Now. Mm-hmm. Now I've thought of one. And it also starts with a mag. Oh. Magneto. Ooh. Oh, Magneto's a good one, especially if you're counting from the comics where he... Okay, go ahead. 
<laughs> well, I, th- I, th- I think I got Norman to, to fanboy. Wee! <laughs> Magneto, in every iteration I've seen him in, in the, in the cartoons that got me into X Men, in the X Men Evolution, in the movies, Magneto starts off as this antagonist who just wants to. You know, he wants the superiority of mutant kind. He wants to punish the humans who would har- harm him. But very often, he undergoes a change. Often because someone worse than he is escalating. Uh, so it's now about subjugating everyone. But slowly, as he works with the other, uh, the X-Men, he begins to come around to their line of thinking, or at least becomes less rigid in his own views. More often, it's anti-hero rather than flat-out antagonist. Mm-hmm. But I believe in the comics, after uh, this may count as spoilers, after Professor Xavier is, is killed again, and <laughs> Cyclops goes off on his own, being an even more extreme mutant terrorist than Magneto, Magneto goes to teach at the school Wolverine set up. And in essence, becomes an X Man himself. Yeah, that, that was amazing. That that was a really good face turn. Like you have your quote unquote boss of the the show being the badass. Like I will um uh, prepare to die or something like that. What, what was the meme? It's meme out there. Go go listen. And suddenly becoming the teacher for the school, becoming the good guy. And it's like, wow, that was awesome. Like. Whoever created that comic scenario was just great. Like, mm, awesome. Let's see, I think it was I Am Magneto, Master of Magnets. Something like that. And it says, like, uh, prepare to die or you die something like that. It's, it's, I don't really remember, but still. And I think I have few. Like, okay, um, if we're talking about comics, um, Venom. Like, uh, there's, there's a specific character in mind for this one. And this is from the... Unlimited uh, Ultimate Spider-Man series from Disney XD. Um, there was a character, well, um, Eddie Brock. We all know who he is. He's the jerk to Peter Parker, and he idolized Spider-Man. Then one day, somehow, the symbiote suit, or the symbiote, attached himself to Eddie. And somehow those two bonded, and they became best friends. And somehow... Eddie's love for Spider-Man kind of affected the symbiote in a way that, hey, um, let's help Spider-Man instead of killing him. So, yay, we are best buddies. And we uh, we started a group called the Spider-Man something, something, something. Um, I, I don't really remember, but still, it was a good run. You have your rival way back when becoming part of the crew. So that's cool. That was cool. I, I think you might be combining characters, Norman, Flash Thompson was the guy who uh, who idolized Spider Man. Oh yeah, sorry, my bad. Like, kind of, oh wow, Eddie Brock. Who was he? <laughs> he was a newspaper reporter who. Oh yeah, okay. Sorry. Made some some morally questionable decisions and got called on it, thanks in part to Spider Man's in- intervention. Okay, so sorry. He blamed, yeah, he blamed, but Flash did in time be- inherit the symbiote and became Agent Venom. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Silver, for correcting me there. Yes, uh, Flash Thompson, not Eddie Brock. Also, I found it uh, Magneto's meme. X Men, welcome to die. Yes, that that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> oh, fun fact! Uh, if you do love Magneto and you love My Little Pony, go to We Love Fine. There's a Magneto Magneto uh, shirt. I have it. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> uh and you know what? Since we're talking about bad guys turning good, and um, do you have one more silver? Because if not, this is going to be the last. I think this will have to be the last. All ah, right, because there's one character here who is a real, real bad jerk, and said character is Kratos from God of War. Oh boy! Yep, he boy, is. Boy, boy. He starts off the show or starts off his game, as you know this. I am a brooding hero. Like, I'm brutish. Let's see me kill all these monsters and blah, blah, blah. Like, oh. And as the show or as the game carries on, you get to see him, well, be a uncaring jerk. He does things because it benefits him. He doesn't really do things because he wants to do it out of the goodness of his heart. 
it's just convenient for him. And yeah, he technically destroys the world of ancient Greece. Yay. Great. <laughs> what a jerk. Yep. So why I'm bringing him up here? Uh, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Mm, he only cares for himself. Yes. He's more of a anti-hero to say the least. But in the latest rendition of God of War, he is best dad. Well, he's a struggling dad. That's for <laughs> yes. sure. Yes. And it, uh, doing that makes him so relatable. Or at least you see what what uh, what the toll of his actions have really taken on him. Because he is he is a, a guy almost empty of the drive that once that once uh, energized him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And playing through God of War, you get to see him. I won't say evolve, but you get to see his character progression from an uncaring father to, oh, um, my son's doing something good. That is sufficient, boy. And seeing those kind of things makes the boy really, really be happy. There's, uh, well, I'm, Silver's planning on buying the game. I have it, but I haven't played it. I just seen Let's Plays of it. So I'm, well, I'm vicariously playing the game. But still, it's one of those scenarios where you get to see the character evolve. And the way that they're doing it here is great. Um, bad guy turns good. I won't say he's the sixth ranger. Well, unless you're counting the crew is just two and one head. So, yeah. Yeah, he he has to be part of a team to be sixth ranger, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's he, Team Kratos. <laughs> team Kratos because he killed everyone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Kratos is an amazing character. Like, I do like where um, the newest God of War is taking Kratos' direction. He is memorable. Like, to me, I like it. So, uh, with that, I have to say we have to call it a day because, yeah, Silver has things to do. And, yeah, we've been writing for so long now. Yay! <laughs> it's been a full run, but it's fun to look at all these characters. Yeah, yeah. And we we have a lot. Like, if we want to count Darth Vader... Yeah, yeah, no, no. The memory of Darth Vader should not be so soiled by whatever's happened in part six. Oh, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So, yeah, with that, um, I think we had a really, or uh, a pretty good discussion. Um, I have to admit that we didn't really focus on the six ranger aspect where they join a team and whatnot. My bad, because it's kind of hard to think of a character who joined a team. Sorry. We did good with the one we had. I think we did. I think it's more... The constant theme is, one, you understand why they fell, you be, you understand why they changed, and you work to show how they integrate with others. And that's true of My Little Pony, Power Rangers, Super Sentai, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, all these things. And yes, even Kratos, when you, when you see... You're told about what he did after his fall in Greece. Mm-hmm. Or is it or is it Rome? I was uh, getting mixed up. Greece. The Greek Pantheon. Greek. So I mostly it is inve- if you invest the time in the characters versus there've been some awful stories where the character says, Oh, I've learned to be good now <laughs> and that's it. It's like, no. Oh. No, that's that's terrible storytelling. Yeah. Like even with God of War Kratos here he had multiple games to build his character up. And his character is kind of a jerk. He, you know what, just play the game or look at videos of the first few rendition of God of War and you understand why. Like, he is a big fat jerk. And you can understand why when this God of War appears, he is very relatable, memorable, and people like him. So, good times. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Silver, what are we going to do for next week's show? Well, I think it's time we got back to Pony, including looking at the start of Season 8 with School Days. Ooh, I can't wait. Oh my god, I can't wait to talk about Season 8. Finally, oh my goodness. Like this, oh, I say this once and I'll say that again. Season 8 has the worst track record for being spoiled. Well, it's true of many, I think. Indeed, indeed. Because Season 7 had its share of spoilers. Well, oh, it was not as bad as Season 8, man. It was not as bad. Well... Well, we'll talk about that when the time comes. Indeed, indeed. So anyway, 
If you would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com. With every support, you'll get a week's early access to the review and discussion podcast, exclusive and deleted content, and a huge thank you from me. Talking about the thank yous, I'd like to thank Lurker Cat, Starstree, Master of Lag, Amy, Mark, Charles, Lucky Knight, and also Tristan. Thank you so much, guys. You have been awesome to me and the show. And Silver, where can the good people find you? Oh, look to the net. Look to Equestria Daily, where I post uh, reviews every uh, Wednesday. Look to my DeviantArt account for Pinkie Pie Says Goodnight Comics. Look to my YouTube for video reviews, and which will also have links to my Patreon, because I could use the support to keep making said videos. So, anyhow, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Zisir Vakwil. And we'll guys see you next week with another fun review show for you guys. See ya. Adios. Oh, I just remember something. Ebenezer Scrooge, he's a bad guy turned good. But he was not part of a team. Aww.